You know what it is about radioactivity that makes people crazy? It's invisible. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't smell it. But it can get you anyway. In this sense, it is the boogeyman. Further, almost no one knows anything about radiation. And so quite understandably, people fill in those blanks of what you don't know can kill you by playing it safe and overestimating the hazard from the radiation. And this already distorted image of the hazards of radioactivity is fanned by the paranoid ramblings of crazies, and especially of the paranoia merchants trying to whip up this fear to make people really scared such that they can capitalize on that fear. Fluoride Shield, Survival Shield, and all the products at InfoWarsLife.com grew out of my quest to try to find the very best compounds from God's cornucopia to protect myself and my family. And from our research, I believe we are bringing you the best, highest quality products. And you have that commitment from Alex Jones and the entire InfoWars crew. Wow, a personal promise from Alex Jones based on the best research from both him and the entire InfoWars crew. And of course, the small print just reinforces how much confidence they have in their research claims. Right? <laughs> Actually, no. This statement has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. And from our research, I believe we are bringing you the best, highest quality products. And you have that commitment from Alex Jones and the entire InfoWars crew. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the worst disaster in nuclear history, Chernobyl. As you can see from space, the radiation level is so high that there is no plant life for hundreds of miles around the reactor. Well, actually, no. Indeed, it turns out that the radiation levels recorded directly outside the plant where this disaster happened can be so low that they are comparable to those that you would get cruising on a commercial jet. And the last measurement I can personally vouch for as I measured it myself. And for many folks, their principal fear of nuclear power is that this is gonna happen, even though this is absolutely impossible. More on that later. But the paranoia merchants still feast on people's insecurity about radiation. And this can lead to really quite, quite crazy folks getting quite large audiences. I average around 600 people on the stream. Oh, all of these people show up on my stream each night uh, is amazing. It truly is, and because they're not here to play games. They're not here for nonsense. And they will tell their audiences the most stupid things ever. California is a wasteland, period. How can it not be a wasteland when you had MOX fuel, the number three reactor, is two million times worse. That, that went straight up into the jet stream at 100 miles per hour. Well, actually, no, California is not a wasteland. Well, <laughs> not a radioactive wasteland anyway. But he's not done telling people things that are diametrically orthogonal to reality with that steely-eyed absolute certainty that can only come with years of marinating one's brain in paranoia juice. Saying iodine-131 only has a half-life of eight days is the craziest thing you can imagine coming out of somebody who's supposed to have an education and supposed to have some morals and ethics. Well, actually, in reality, there is kind of this scientific consensus on the half-life of iodine-131. And yeah, it does actually look like a pretty good eight days to me. But he's just getting warmed up. What you're about to witness is simply the most stupid statement ever made about radioactivity. I'm arming you with knowledge that's invaluable. I've researched this all extensively over many years now. In order to really wrap your mind around all of that, I think that Dixie Cup says it all. A Dixie Cup full of this yellow cake from that 40 mile pit. You put that in a restaurant, you'll kill everybody there within an hour for the next four billion years. Like I said earlier, just keep filling that restaurant up. If I had a cup of 238 here, I would die before I finished that sentence. I can put that cup of 238 in a restaurant, it'll kill everybody in the restaurant inside of an hour, even if they just walked in and left, they would die an hour later. 
And that would go on for 4.5 billion years times 10 because the way it decays, right? <laughs> Let's start with the bloody obvious stuff. Where do you think this uranium ore comes from? You dig it out of the ground, where it's been for almost the entire history of the Earth. Indeed, it's a significant reason why the middle of the Earth is still so hot. So if you have a little speck of uh, uranium-238, you're supposed to dig up six inches of topsoil, 900 feet around it, and put a fence around it with universal signs on it. So yeah, according to this guy, almost the entire of America should be classified as a radioactive wasteland. Admittedly, when the Earth formed some four and a half billion years ago, there was about twice as much radiation from uranium as there is now. But somehow life still managed to muddle through it. Well, anyway, scroll the clock forward about four and a half billion years. Man comes along and digs this radioactive shit out of the ground and finds something useful to do with it. Initially, it's refined as yellow cake. Uh, guess what color that is? It was initially produced in huge quantities when it was mined in an effort to get radium, which is basically radioactive stuff that glows in the dark. Stuff that makes this clock radioactive. I actually leave it there, and what you'll find is it'll bury the needle. Uh... However, there really weren't that many uses for this element, uranium. But curiously, while refining tons of this material that they dug out of the ground, they made the stunning observation that almost everyone who merely touched this yellow cake didn't die instantly. If I had a cup of 238 here, I would die before I finished that sentence. If they had, they might have been able to think of some military use for this instant yellow death powder in World War II. Further, I've actually got to confess. I've actually handled yellow cake, this is this uranium oxide, in exactly the fashion stated here. That is uranium nitrate. There you go. Very yellow. A Dixie cup full of this yellow cake from that 40 mile pit. You put that in a restaurant, you'll kill everybody there within an hour. If I had a cup of 238 here, uranium nitrate, I would die before I finished that sentence. I've been studying uranium 238 because of wars for almost eight years straight. I've been studying uranium 238 because of wars for almost eight years straight. Maybe this instant death has a bit of a delay on it because I've completed a little more than one sentence before dying. Indeed, it's now over 10 years since I handled this uranium oxide like this, and I'm still not instantly dead. See, it turns out that this yellow powder that didn't cause instant death was kind of colourful, and so they started using this chemical in glazes for plates and the such like. You see, while uranium is actually radioactive, it's a weak alpha emitter. Alphas have a lousy penetrating power, which means you can handle things like this with gloves with essentially no ill effects. What I mean by uranium is a weak alpha emitter per nucleus is it doesn't give off much radiation that quickly, that it's got a half-life of about 5 billion years. That means in the entire history of the Earth, only about half of the original uranium that was here has decayed. And now just compare that to the same amount of, say, iodine-131, which would release about the same amount of radiation in eight days. So maybe the most famous alpha emitter is polonium-210, because it was used to murder a critic of the Russian government. You see, outside of the body, alpha emitters are almost harmless, which is why this assassin could have carried around this fatal dose of this material in a solution in a glass vial in his pocket with essentially no ill effects. However, if you eat it, it's an entirely different story. You see, alphas might not travel that far, but when they do, they do a lot of damage. So if you get these alpha emitters dissolved in your body, they can be really quite nasty. So comparable amounts of uranium, it turns out, release the same number of alpha particles in 5 billion years as polonium-210 releases in about half a year. That is, polonium is about a billion times more radioactive than uranium. Now, a fatal dose of polonium-210 is about 50 nanograms. That is 50 billionths of a gram. 
So scaling this up, you find out that you would have to eat 50 grams of uranium to get a fatal radiation dose. About the same mass as a chocolate bar. However, it turns out that uranium is a heavy metal toxin comparable to lead. That is, there is a chemical toxicity to eating uranium. That is, the chemical toxicity of eating uranium is comparable to eating lead. And that's eating lead, not eating lead. Although, as it turns out, in both cases, the fatal dose is about the same. A few grams or so. So it's one of those interesting ones that while uranium is actually radioactive, if you manage to eat it, uranium would be kind of like eating lead. Uh, well, firstly, of course, most of it wouldn't dissolve. You'd have to dissolve the metal and then drink the solution. But if you did that, chemically, it will poison you to death long before you die of the radiation sickness. Anyways, I digress. Then came World War II, and folks started realizing that uranium nuclei had some rather specific properties. You see, uranium mostly naturally occurs as two isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238. The natural occurrence is about 99% of the 238 isotope and about 1% of the 235 isotope. And just so you know, the 235 isotope has a half-life of about a billion years versus five or so billion for 238. So an absolutely colossal sum of money went into separating these isotopes with the U-235 being used to make the little boy bomb which was dropped on Hiroshima. I know, was someone complaining about radioactive fallout? Anyway, so give or take, this means that for every tonne of uranium-235 that you make, you create about 100 tonnes of uranium-238. Anyway, years went by and it turned out that plutonium was much better for making bombs than uranium. The bummer was, though, that plutonium didn't exist. Well, not naturally anyway. However, as luck would have it, it turns out you can make plutonium from uranium-238 if you have a nuclear reactor. Now, to run a reactor on uranium doesn't require anywhere near as much of this expensive enrichment as making bomb material. And this is a couple of advantages, and I really can't stress this enough. With all nuclear power reactors, it is impossible to get a nuclear explosion from them. And this is almost pervasively the fear of nuclear power, as shown in this 1980s video, Dancing with Tears in Our Eyes. And the flowers are still standing. So why can they never explode? Well, in order to get a nuclear explosion, you basically need all of those nuclei to release their energy in as short a period as possible. And such a chain reaction is typically all over in less than a millisecond. So in order to get that to happen, you need very high enrichment of uranium-235. Otherwise, it doesn't go boom. It just sort of gets very hot and melts in a fizzle. So for reactors, you don't want things to go boom. You want the uranium to get hot enough to boil water and then to use that to run electricity generating turbines for an extended period of time. To do that, you only need a mild enrichment of uranium. Indeed, most power reactors run on only a few percent enrichment of uranium. And this just cannot sustain these critical geometric chain reactions that are required for a nuclear explosion. They're just to dilute. That is, it is utterly, utterly impossible to get a nuclear explosion from them. The nearest analogy would be gunpowder, which really works quite well when it's pure. But if you dilute that gunpowder with sand, water, or oil, it won't explode. It can't explode. That is, fireworks stored in a lake are about as much of an explosive hazard as a nuclear reactor presents of this hazard of a nuclear explosion. And the best, or worst, depending on how you look at it, you can get out of a power reactor is the core gets up to a few thousand degrees Celsius, at which point everything melts. And then it just melts everything it touches. And as it does so, it gets more dilute which attenuates its power generating capability and lowers its temperature until the thing really quite quickly cools down till it's this barely solid glowing mass. So currently most of the nuclear economy is built around uranium-235 
And for every ton of uranium-235, you get about 100 tons of uranium-238. That is, uranium-238 is pretty much a byproduct of the nuclear industry. Its main property is that it's very dense. So what can you do with a very dense metal? Well, for that, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait for the next video in this series.